Hi everyone, my name is Soma, and this is my video for the Khan Academy Talent Search, an introduction to the periodic table of the elements. The periodic table is a complex yet organized way of representing all of the elements that we know, both naturally occurring and man-made. These elements consist of atoms, which make up pretty much everything in the universe. If you thought a cell or its mitochondria or even its ribosomes were small, these are made up of atoms. Before we begin, a little history. Back before the table existed, chemists and other scientists were interested in isolating elements, comparing them, and understanding their properties, as well as experimenting. Though other scientists had developed their own versions of the table, a Russian scientist made, named Dmitry Mendeleev had the most comprehensive one. It was so good that he was able to leave gaps in the table where he predicted that elements that had yet to be discovered would fit. There are three classes of elements on the table. Metals are most abundant and make up the majority of the left side of the table. There's a small group of semi-metals, also known as metalloids, that form a diagonal near the right side of the, tab right side of the table, and the remaining elements are non-metals. In terms of conductivity, metals are the best at conducting electricity, metalloids are okay at conducting electricity, and non-metals are the worst at conducting electricity. All elements come in one of three states of matter, solids, liquids, or gases. Most elements are solid at room temperature, as you can see from the table. A handful are gases, and only two are liquids, bromine and mercury. Each square on the periodic table depicts an element. You can gain a lot of information from this square. For example, consider carbon. The symbol for the element is largest and resides in the center of the square, while the full name of the element sits either below or above the symbol, in this case below. At the top left is the atomic number, which tells you the number of protons an element has. Underneath the name of the element is the atomic weight. This number is the weighted average of the atomic masses of all the isotopes of the element. Here, I just mentioned an isotope. What's that, you ask? An isotope is an atom of the same element, but with a different number of neutrons. Imagine that each circle here is a condensed nucleus of a carbon atom. Every carbon atom has six protons. If it doesn't have six protons, it's not carbon. But the number of neutrons in each atom can differ. The three major isotopes of carbon are carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. These are two different ways of representing an isotope. The 12, 13, and 14 are the atomic mass of each carbon. The atomic mass is the sum of the protons and neutrons in an atom. If carbon always has six protons, you can deduce the number of neutrons from these numbers. Carbon-12 has an atomic mass of 12. And remember, and the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if carbon-12 has an atomic mass of 12, and you subtract the number of protons in a carbon, which is always 6, then you can figure out the number of neutrons in this carbon atom. And 12 minus 6 is 6. The same can be done for carbon-13. Here, its atomic mass is 13. You know carbon always has 6 protons, so if, when you subtract 6 from 13, you get 7. And we can do the same thing for carbon-14. The atomic mass is 14 minus carbon always has 6 protons, so you get 8 neutrons. There are not equal amounts of each isotope. This image gives an idea of the abundance of each one. Carbon-12 carbon is the most, most abundant, abundant isotope. isotope. This explains why the atomic weight of carbon is so close to 12. Now, the periodic table is a set of rows and columns, organized by both atomic number and similar chemical and physical properties. The rows, or periods, are labeled 1 to 7. And as you go from left to right, the atomic number increases. The columns, also known as families or groups, are where similar properties emerge. The columns are labeled 1 to 18, but the eight highest columns, the two on the left and the six on the right, are what I'll focus on. Each of these eight columns consists of elements that have similar properties within each column. In the first column reside the alkali metals, all except for hydrogen. These metals are extremely reactive and have one electron in their valence shell. They tend to spontaneously combust in air and especially in water. 
As you go down the column, they become even more reactive. The second column has the alkali earth metals, which are less reactive than the alkali metals and have two electrons in their valence shell. The next four rows are named after the element that is at the very top of the column. So you have the boron group with three electrons in its valence shell, the carbon group with four, the nitrogen group with five, and the oxygen group with six. The seventh column is a special class of elements known as the halogens. They have seven electrons in their valence shell, and the elements in this row are extremely reactive and very toxic. Halogens can react with metals to produce salts, a broad category of compounds which includes table salt, or NaCl. Finally, we have a group of elements called the noble gases. These elements are very unreactive because they have eight electrons in their valence shell, otherwise known as a full octet. This means they don't want to give up any electrons, nor do they want to take any electrons away or share any electrons with another atom. To round out the table, columns 3 to 12 in the center consist of the transition metals, which are similar in the way they look and act. The two rows at the bottom are called the lanthanides, after lanthanum number 57, and the actinides, after, after actinium number 89. These bottom two rows can actually fit inside the periodic table, but this is what it would look like. They are set apart due to their different properties and interesting electron configuration, but mainly for convenience. Knowing the way the table is structured is important for later on when understanding electron orbitals and how electrons are arranged in atoms. The last thing I wanted to mention deals with the names of some of the elements on the table. If you happen to be looking for a particular element on the table, just by looking at the symbols, it may be hard to pick out a few of the more common ones. What's AG? AU? HG? What about PB? And so on. Where are iron, copper, and sodium? Clearly, they should be something like I for iron, CO for copper, and SO for sodium, right? Well, that's actually wrong. AG is silver, HG is mercury, AU is gold, and PB is lead. So why the wild names? Well, it turns out that all these elements have Latin origins, and that the Latin name that the symbol comes from doesn't always match up with the English name. Here are a few common examples. The symbol for mercury comes from the Latin word hydrogerum, meaning water silver. The symbol for silver comes from the Latin word argentum, meaning gray or shining. The symbol for gold, AU, comes from the Latin word for gold, aurum. The symbol for lead comes from the Latin word plumbum, meaning lead. If this looks familiar, it should be. The word plumber also comes from the same word. The symbol for iron, FE, comes from the Latin word ferrum, which is Latin for iron. Copper comes from the Latin word for copper, cuprum. The symbol for sodium actually comes from a Greek word, natrio. Lastly, the symbol for potassium comes from the Neo-Latin word, callium. I hope you were able to learn a little bit about the periodic table from this video. It's one of my favorite aspects of chemistry and is incredibly interesting because there's so much to learn from the seemingly simple tool. I end this video with another favorite subject of mine, Spanish. Adios guys, bye.